Ye Gods by Tom Holt Chapter 8 On his way back up, Virgil was stopped by a hairy old man with long fingernails, whom he recognised at once. He shuddered and tried very hard to look like somebody else. Excuse me, said Pluto, but have you seen a dog? Frequently, Virgil replied, so thank you all the same, but... No, Pluto said, what I mean is, have you seen a dog recently? Virgil considered for a moment. Can't say I have, he said, not for ages, but I'm trying to give them up, actually, so it's no skin off my nose. Good Lord, is that the... Pluto looked at him carefully. Yeah, he said, I know you, don't I? Me? Virgil shook his head vigorously. That's highly unlikely, isn't it? Pluto frowned. I do know you, he said accusingly. You're dead. Well, yes, Virgil said. If you want to be biologically exact, I suppose I am. But I try not to dwell on it too much. Clearly, where you come from, tact is held in roughly the same esteem as personal appearance, and uh, now I must be. Then what are you doing here? Where? Here, Pluto said, in the land of the living, you should be in. And the same to you too, Virgil said quickly. Must rush. Bye. It was fortunate for the poet that Pluto had other things on his mind, for the ex-god of the dead has never, despite his best efforts, completely retired, and he has extremely strong views on dead people who wander about topside, fiddling about with the great chain of being and startling old ladies. Instead of taking the matter further, however, Pluto simply shrugged and carried on following the dog wasn't difficult. Actually, in many places, the tiles on the walls of the corridors were already starting to bubble, and the smell was unmistakable. He might be three-headed, immortal, and capable of human speech, but Cerberus was very much a dog. Down past the normal, everyday levels now, and Pluto began to feel that familiar feeling of uneasiness, together with a certain very faint nostalgia. It had been years since he had last visited Hell, or as he would always tried to think of it, the Autumn Leaves Rest Home, and, well, you never can completely let go, can you? My God, Pluto said to himself as he wandered through the endless passageways. What have they done to the old place? All right. It never exactly been what you'd call cosy. Too many souls in torment for that. But at least he tried his best. You can do a lot with the odd pot plant here and a frame print there, the occasional lick of paint and roll of wood chip when the budget could run to it, even just little things like a table, a couple of chairs and a few old colour supplements made a great deal of difference to the guests. Pluto always thought of them as guests. After all, a lot of people have to spend a lot of time here and the least you can do is try and encourage them to think of it as, well, their home. He shook his head sadly and tried to remember where the laundry cupboard used to be. He arrived on the platform just as the train was pulling in and jumped nimbly through the doors, stepping over the crushed bodies with the ease of long practice. The train was always pretty full at this time of day, he remembered, but he found one of those corner seats which have a little blue notice above it saying, Please give up this seat if an irrevocably damned person needs it. Put a damned expression on his face and sat down. He was just starting to wonder where the dog could have got to when he became aware of someone standing over him. I said, Tickets, please. Pluto looked up into what he took at first to be a pair of blue industrial lasers and nearly jumped out of his skin. Look, said the spectre, have you got a ticket or not? Pluto twitched slightly and the spectre glowered at him. If yellow-fanged, gourd-headed monsters can glower, the point has never been properly researched, understandably. Pluto pulled himself together. Well, no, he admitted. You're new here, aren't you? If you haven't got a ticket, said the spectre, how Pluto asked himself, does he manage to avoid securing his own upper lip every time he speaks? You'll have to buy one now. That or I put you off at the next stop. Pluto, who knew what the next stop was, rummaged vigorously in his pocket for change. Being a god is all very well, but one doesn't like to push one's luck. Mercifully, he found some money. How much? he asked, and the spectre told him. While it was writing out a ticket, Pluto laid the two coins across his own closed eyelids and weirded. Here, said the spectre, haven't you got anything smaller? Pluto apologised, took his ticket and his change, and started breathing again. Spectres were definitely new since last time, although he remembered that there had been demons. 
state registered demons naturally they'd been pretty horrible true but at least they were polite and had their watches pinned to their frontal scales the panic over he leaned back in his seat and watched the stations go by lechery gluttony wrath change here for murder parricide and regicide sloth sloth circus high street sloth sloth central sloth broadway greed escalate a link to simony pride and being found out being found out yes thought pluto I guess I really am out of touch. He shrugged and started reading the advertisements. Ah, Jason said. Hello there. Me and my big mouth, he said to himself. Who was it insisted on having the lights on then? Old Mr Dickhead, that's who. Hello yourself. There was a long pause and Jason took a cautious look at his new companion. Say what you like about Jason. He's not one of those idiots who takes against people just because of the colour of their skin. But he does like them to have skin, and this chap palpably didn't. Instead, he seemed to have masonry. Description is the lifeblood of narrative, so let us start with the furniture. The throne he sat in was made from some sort of very shiny black material, and its four feet carved in the shape of disconcertingly realistic dragon's heads rested on nothing at all. The little light that there was seemed to be coming from the throne, but it wasn't as if there were little bulbs hidden discreetly behind the reliefs of writhing serpents and contorted bull-headed shapes. The light just seemed to ooze out of the metal, like acid from a very old battery. There were other things oozing out of the throne, apart from the light, of course, but since they seemed to be turning into snakes and spiders and other lassie things as soon as they got clear of the throne, Jason decided to do the sensible thing and pretend he hadn't seen them. So much for the furniture... Now for the clothes. He wore a flowing black robe, heavy with glittering black gemstones, jet and obsidian, that sort of thing, although ordinary gemstones don't hurt your eyes so much when you look at them. The cloth, Jason assumed for the sake of a quiet life that it was cloth, was simply the colour and texture of the absence of light. On his feet, he wore shoes in the shape of huge hooked talons, except that they weren't shoes. We are pussyfooting, we know, but that is because since the great adjective shortage of 1976, we simply can't get the materials. We will therefore leave it at very horrible and hope that you will bear with us and use your imaginations (laughs) carefully. Have a sausage roll, he said. Jason grinned weakly. (laughs) No thanks, he said. I had something before I came out. Uh, Really, uh, yes. Well, it's, I mean, like, don't let me keep you or anything. I, uh, you're not. Oh, I, uh, I don't get many visitors. It's nice to speak to someone occasionally, even just a mortal. Well, that's very kind of you to say so, but I'm sure you're really very busy and... Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, 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 yes, um... Are you, he said, Jason Derry? That, Jason felt, was one of those trick questions, like, was it you who brought the wind or... He made a small, indecisive gesture. Um, uh, he said. You are, aren't you? Um, uh, your dog seems to think you are. My dog? I take it that's your dog. Who's a good boy, then? Jason looked round to see Cerberus nodding all three heads at once. Not for the first time, Jason remembered that he didn't much like dogs. Yeah, he said. Ah, he said. That's all right, then. There was a blinding flash of multicoloured light, and the throne and its occupant vanished. The sheer force of so much light knocked Jason clean off his feet. Not that he was exactly on them to begin with, and he fell headlong into nothing at all. Or, to be pedantically accurate, a carpet. Quite a nice carpet, in fact. Woolly, deep pile, the colour of spilt tea. Sorry about that, said the voice above his head. That was clumsy of me. Slowly, Jason looked up, and his eyes met the toes of a pair of slippers, blue, slightly scoffed, comfortable-looking. "'Pleased to meet you, Jason,' said the voice. "'You don't mind if I call you Jason, do you?' Jason managed to detach his eyes from the slippers and looked up further still. The throne and living statue had gone. However, the floor had come back. Also the walls, the ceiling, the sword of what's it, but not its name, and the bag of sandwiches. The latter two exhibits were on a coffee table beside an armchair in which was seated a very nice, apparently quite friendly old gentleman in a dressing gown and blue slippers. He had a plate of the most delicious-looking sausage rolls in his lap and he offered one to Jason. Sorry about all the black stuff, he said, but in my position you can't be too careful. It's supposed to scare the crap out of people. Of course, I've 
Never actually seen it myself, so I don't know if it works. Does it? Yes, said Jason, with his mouth full. For some reason, which he couldn't quite fathom, he felt a strong urge to burst out laughing at this point. Being possessed of semi-divine willpower, however, he managed to keep it to a discreet snurge. Oh, good, the nice man replied. Now, let me introduce myself, and then we can have a cup of tea and a chat. My name's Gelos. I gather you wanted to meet me. Your economy, said Diana carefully, and raise you fifty. Apollo nodded listlessly. Diana muttered something under her breath and rolled the dice. Malful you, she crowed. We're welching on our national debt, so sucks to you. Apollo hardly seemed to notice. That's nice, he said distractedly. Look, tell me when it's my go, will you? I'm just watching something over here. Diana scowled. Paul, she said, I've just wiped out three of your major clearing banks. Aren't you interested? Sorry? Paul, Diana banged her goblet of ambrosia sharply on the table. Will you please pay attention to the game? <coughs> Apollo replied. Could you just bear with me a moment while I just knit down to earth? Perhaps you could just ask Ma or someone to play my hand for me while I'm away. Diana was now seriously worried. Asking a fellow god to take your go for you was like offering the big bad wolf a job in a creche. Is it, um, uh, is it important? she asked. Quite, Apollo answered. Yes. Shouldn't I call Min, then? No, Apollo said firmly. Decidedly not. Why? Apollo considered his choice of words carefully. For the same reason, he said at last, why you shouldn't remove rings from coffee tables or coarse grain sandpaper. It won't be long. Diana watched as he disappeared into the far darkness, shrugged, and tentatively moved the Chinese army into Nepal. As she did so, a single golden rose leaf drifted slowly down from above her head, twirled gracefully and settled on her knee. She picked it up and saw that there were tiny letters picked out in it in fire. I saw that, they said. Ah, oh, that's, Diana said, and removed her army. What do you mean, said Ms. Fisicelli. There aren't any. I'm sorry, Mary replied ruefully. The jar's empty. Ms. Fisicelli scratched her head. That's funny, she said. There were plenty when I looked this morning. I oh, know, said Mary. Pardon me. I ate them, Mary explained. Ms. Fisicelli suddenly became very still and cold, like a mammoth in a glacier. You ate them, she repeated. Well, <laughs> um, yes. Apollo's sacred olives. Uh, yes, I, um... I see, said Ms. Fisichelli. Well, she went on, that's fine. Thank you so much for letting me know. I suppose Mr. A is going to have to make do with tin olives from the deli just as once. I'm sure he won't mind. I, I, and now, Ms. Fisichelli continued remorselessly, provided always that you haven't eaten the altar and the sacred tripod, I think it's time you made a start. Pass me the simpulum, please. Mary bowed her head and handed the pythoness the stimpulum without comment. Nuts, said a voice at the back of the red. I was just hungry, that's all. Ms. Fisicelli, meanwhile, had turned on the sacred gas and was just trying to get the sacred lighter to work. Guess who forgot to change the holy flint again? When the sacred flame suddenly leapt out of its own accord, nearly taking her eyebrows off. Good damn it, you clumsy! Oh, gee, I'm sorry. In the presence of her god, Ms. Fisichelli's aggravation dissolved. I wasn't expecting. The divine head nodded on its neck of flame. Okay, it said. My fault, sorry. <laughs> Look, can we do without all this mumbo jumbo for once? I've only popped out for a moment, and I don't want men. I mean, this can only be a brief audience. I've got to, well, see a man. Master! About a dog. I see, Master. So, said the divine head, if it's all the same to you, girls, I'm just going to slip in something more comfortable back in a tick. The sacred flame went suddenly out, and the patera, deprived of its support, dropped like a stone and shattered on the rim of the tripod. Apollo materialised next to it, just in time to be hit in the back of the hand by a flying potshard. The ow! Ugh! He said. Master! Betty, said Apollo irritably. Let's just leave all that stuff, shall we? As a matter of fact, I'm perfectly capable of getting here on my own without having to be conjured up, dematerialised, transmuted into the spirit, sucked up through eight yards of narrow copper pipe and set fire to. So in future, I'll trouble you just to leave a message with reception. All right. 
Mary giggled very slightly, thinking of the olives. Ms. Fisichelli, if she noticed her disciple's lapse, ignored it. I'm terribly sorry to have bothered you, she said. Apollo sighed, removed a back issue of the Journal of Byzantine Studies from the armchair, sat down. That's all right, he said wearily. Can we get on now, please? Ms. Fisichelli flushed and sat down on the sofa. For her part, Mary folded her legs gracefully and kneeled on the floor. Apollo noticed, reflected that he was old enough to be her great, 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 great grandfather, and looked firmly at the Pythoness, who became suddenly flustered. It's nothing, really, she stammered. It's just, uh, you did say to let you know if I came across anything unusual about the Derry boy. And there have been other things, too. And you know how sometimes even things that don't seem important at the time? The gods can be cruel, terrible, illogical and heartless, but sometimes they can be patient, too. Apollo smiled reassuringly. I'm sure you're right, he said. Please tell me all about it. Ms. Fisicelli swallowed the large clot of mud that apparently formed in her throat and said, Well, yes, it's like this. Uh... Apollo smiled even more until Ms. Fisicelli could feel little flakes of skin detaching themselves from the tip of her nose. Perhaps, she said, you should see for yourself. Apollo frowned. How do you mean? The pythoness twitched nervously. In the sacred bowl, she said. The sacred bowl? Apollo looked puzzled. You mean, that thing still works? Well, well, I never, Apollo went on. I thought it had packed up in the 5th century when that clown Amaryllis IV used it for frying anchovies. Have you got it working again? I cleaned it, Ms. Fisicelli murmured, and it seemed okay. You don't mind, do you? Only it can be a great help sometimes, and well, she said quickly, actually, I've been using it to watch the baseball. You can't get the baseball on Greek TV, not even with a satellite dish, and Chicago have got the Rose Bowl this year, and... It works then, Apollo said. Seems to, said Miss Fisicelli. I'll fetch it. She jumped up and scurried off into the kitchen. While she was gone, Apollo tried hard not to look at her new disciple at the corner of his eye. To the gods, Homer was fond of saying all things are possible. <laughs> he was wrong, uh, Apollo said. Sorry, Mary smiled, warmly but respectfully. Apollo suddenly felt a bit tongue-tied. Um, are you, well, doing anything tomorrow evening? Mary continued to smile. Only, uh, Apollo went on, I haven't had two tickets for the open-air Bad Vibes concert in Central Park, and I thought... Sorry, Mary said, only I'm washing my hair tomorrow night. Oh, Mary smiled again. Uh, an another time then, maybe? Smile. And then Ms. Fisichelli came back with the sacred bowl, and Apollo wrenched his attention back to far less important things. More important. Damn! I'm all out of holy water, she said, so I use Perrier. It's Jenny okay, I found. She put the bowl down on the tripod, fumbled in her pocket for her sistrum, and started to hum the incantation. Apollo, who is also ex-god of music, winced, thanked her, and hummed it for her. At once a pale golden glow filled the room, while the electric light quietly went away and found something else to do. There was also a strange, mysterious fragrance, but that had more to do with the fact that Ms. Fisichelli's lemon curd was boiling over on the gas stove than anything particularly divine. Apollo stood up and peered into the depths of the bowl. Hey, he said, this is good. Ms. Fisichelli simpered. On the meniscus of the still slightly effervescent water, there was an image. There was a dog. It was lying on a carpet, gnawing three bones. It was doing this at the feet of a man who was sitting in a very comfortable-looking chair in an almost unbearably cosy-looking room, eating what appeared to be a slice of exquisitely yummy chocolate cake. Opposite him sat what could only be described as a very nice, friendly-looking old gentleman who tended to wave his hands about a lot, making his companion laugh with his mouth full. Well, uh, said Apollo, I'll be a son of a thunderbolt. How do you turn the sound up on this thing? Ooh, said Ms. Fisichelli. Sorry? You can't. Oh, said Apollo. No sound then? No. Never mind. Hey, now, what's happening? Ms. Fisichelli flushed. It, it does that, she said. The picture of the nice room had vanished as suddenly as it had come, and in its place was the image of another man, a man with long hair and long fingernails. He appeared for all the world to be standing up in an underground carriage. 
Now he was walking to the connecting door between the carriages. He was opening it and uh, getting out. There was a terrific hiss, and all the water in the ball suddenly became steam and flew upwards. The ball overheated, cracked, and shattered in splinters, one of which hit Apollo on the nose. Ow! Ow! ow he said. Then Fusicelli looked as if she'd just gone into deep shock, and Apollo, as soon as he had recovered himself, helped her to a seat. Is she all right? he asked nervously. I think so, Mary replied. She's a bit highly strung, you know. Apollo nodded. I wonder what made it suddenly do that, he said to himself, but aloud. Too much current, Mary replied. Apollo nodded and then turned round quickly. Sorry, he said and stared at her. I'm just guessing, said Mary modestly, but maybe you put too much strain on it, making it look down into the forbidden regions. Apollo's divine brain told his divine heart and divine body to stay cool and let it handle this. Just out of interest, he said as casually as he could, how did you know that it was the forbidden regions? Mary caught her breath, gave Apollo a look of pure poison, turned into a huge eagle and left the room. In the dry heat of a Betamax sun, a column of Roman soldiers stopped in the market square of Tiberiopolis, until recently known as Jerusalem. A young man was led forward and made to take up a large wooden cross. As he did so, he instinctively examined the workmanship. Hmm, he said, call that a mortise and tenon joint, because I don't. The centurion snapped an impatient command to his troops, but they refused to budge. On his inquiring as to why this might be, they told him that Good Friday was a bank holiday, and if they were expected to go around crucifying people, it was going to have to be time and half. The centurion fumed for a moment, said, Oh, bugger this for a game of soldiers, and stalked off to the wine shop on the corner. After a long silence, the three condemned prisoners edged quietly away and went home, the soldiers lifting not a finger to stop them. That was why it was a Betamax world after all. Unlike most Betamax worlds, however, this one survived the inevitable ensuing possibility crisis and remained extant. This was because of what can only be described as a spatio-temporal cock-up, involving the arrival of a team of interplanetary missionaries from the neighbouring Betamax world, where interstellar travel had been developed before the discovery of printing. Soon after the mass conversion of the Betamax human race to Methodism, however, the severe possibility problems caused thereby were all solved at stroke by the timely intervention of a huge meteor which smashed the planet into rubble. The reason why possibility errors are treated so seriously by the authorities, however, is because once they start, they tend to continue. It therefore came as no surprise to the incident room staff at Possibility Police HQ when particles of incandescent matter released by the destruction of Betamax 9567432 burst into the atmosphere of the world which originally sent out the missionaries, landed on the roofs of all the churches and burned them all down. The embarrassing result of this was that the majority of the population at once abandoned Christianity, thus cancelling the projected nuclear religious war against the Eastern heretics, which should have ended the planet, and set about persuading the remaining faithful of the error of their ways, inventing printing as a necessary method of information dissemination. The world thus created was so perilously close to the absolutely possible that the police were compelled to intervene in the interest of possibility preservation by planting a few plausible impossibilities in rarely visited areas of the planet and then coming back next day and atomizing the entire planetary system under article 47-1 of the Sirius convention even then however their problems were far from over since the force of the explosion of betamax 5609765 was so violent that planet vhs our planet was temporarily rocked on its axis with the result that at a crucial moment a bookshe thursday was suddenly introduced into the week the thursday in fact when jason derry went down to the underground to find kelos more important it meant that an extra day had been introduced which had not been foreseen when the order of play was drawn up at the very start of the game as a result at the vital point of the story which follows it was nobody's go at all you mean to tell me jupiter said that all this time we've had a mole Apollo wondered whether it was worth pointing out that it had been an eagle rather than a mole, but decided no, probably not. Yes, he said. I see. Jupiter had this knack of asking questions he already knew the answers to. A common mannerism among the omniscient, but aggravating nevertheless. And this mole has been collaborating with... with... that person all this time? Yes. Why is it, Apollo asked himself, that just because I'm the one who tells him, it's suddenly all my fault? There, I'm doing it now. I know exactly why, because I'm a mug. That's why. 
And nobody noticed. Is that it? Yes. And you lot, Jupiter went on, call yourself gods, do you? Yes. Jupiter laughed and black clouds scurried guiltily across the skies of Earth to the positions they should have been in ten minutes ago. It can be tough being a cloud. And now, Jupiter said, that you have at last found out, may I ask what you're proposing to do about it? Apollo recognised that this was a question that couldn't be answered with yes and searched his divine mind for an answer. I don't know, he said. The old brain a bit slow today, is it? Well... Get it sorted out, said Jupiter. When you're the great sky god, it's no problem at all to shout in capital letters. In fact, when he was really upset, he could shout in boldface, italics and pitch ten. Yes, said Apollo, we... Now! Yes, indeed, Apollo said. But for all his omniscience, Jupiter didn't seem to understand the implications of... But he just frowned, with the result that race meetings on four continents were washed out. Apollo backed away, tripped over a self-propelled footstool, which apologised in Latin, and ran. Not long after leaving the presence of the father of gods and men, he bumped into Mars. To be exact, he trod on his foot. Watch it, said the ex-god of war. I've had enough of it today with Claymore Mines without you as well. Apollo apologised. He'd often reflected on the aptness of his name and stopped running. Mars looked at him. What's up, Paul? he asked. You seem a bit flustered. Flustered? Apollo turned the adjective over in his mind. A bit on the weak side, perhaps, but it was in the right ballpark, so to speak. Uh, yes, he added from sheer habit. Why? There's been a bit of a cock-up, said Apollo. Everyone else was having a go at understatement, he said to himself, so why not me too? And I've got to sort it out, apparently. Hard luck, Mars said sympathetically. Now what's happened? You know Prometheus's eagle... Mars nodded, making the shrapnel-shredded plume of his helmet nod. Well, Apollo went on, apparently it turns out that bloody fowl's gone and changed sides on us. It's been working for you-know-who all along. Really? Yes. Mars thought for a moment. I wouldn't call ripping someone's liver out for him every morning and evening working for him exactly, he said. Cheaper than a dialysis machine, I suppose, but... It's not that, said Apollo. It seems that the dratted eagle's been running errands for him, subverting heroes, spying on us. Spying? That's right, Apollo grunted, been dressing up as a human and passing itself off as the apprentice pythoness of Delphi. Apollo reflected briefly on his brief infatuation with the feathered temptress and shuddered, which means that the big P has known every move we make. <sighs> Vexing, isn't it? Mars rubbed his chin. You mean like a sort of mole? he asked. Apollo smiled. He could say it now. No, Ma, he said. An eagle can't be a mole. Biologically impossible. Mars frowned impatiently. You know what I mean, he said. Bit of a problem, that. You have my sympathy. Also, Apollo went on, though I'm pleased to say the old sod hasn't found out yet, he's also got Cerberus on his side. Cerberus. That's right. Bit poor, isn't it? Pluto's going to be in for a nasty shock any minute now, I can tell you. He's down there. At this very minute, said Apollo, with just a hint of less than charitable feeling, looking for Jason Derry. He's the hero who's been subverted. Just then Minerva came in. She was somewhat red in the face and not in the best of moods. This was understandable since she just had to tell Jupiter about a certain dog. There you are, she said. You are a pair of idiots, aren't you? Mars opened his mouth to protest, but Minerva ignored him. Anyway, she went on, here's your orders from the boss. Paul, you get down to Earth and deal with Prometheus. Nail that eagle and get a replacement, all right? All right, Apollo sighed. And you, Ma, Minerva said, you'd better pop down and see that Pluto's all right and deal with Derry Boy while you're at it. He's getting out of hand and... You're joking, Mars said. I was listening to the commentary just now, and it said he's armed with the sword of... Don't be such a baby, Minerva replied. You are supposed to be the driver of the spoil, Ma, or had you forgotten? Driving the spoil, I can handle, Ma said rebelliously. Driving the spoil is what I'm good at. Getting snipped up into Tagliatelli by muscular youths with magic swords does not feature in my job description. Sorry, but... 
Mars? Minerva looked at him sternly. You don't want me to tell Pa about your trip to Greenham Common, do you? Mars sat like a tent with Norpaw. You wouldn't, he said weakly. He wouldn't like it, would he? She said. A son of his climbing over the wire and daubing no nukes here in green paint on the missile silos. I think you'd better do as you're told for once, don't you? Mars inflated his lungs to speak. Language, said Minerva preemptively. Anyway, said the ex god of war, what does he mean by deal with? He might at least tell me. Jupiter thinks, said Minerva with an iceberg smile, that the constellation of Cassiopeia looks a bit lopsided. Could do with an extra star somewhere in the middle. See to it, will you? Minerva turned, adjusted her owl, and walked serenely out. Mars drew in a deep breath, sighed, and jerked his head at the space Minerva had just occupied. Daddy's girl, he said. So, said Gelos, that's more or less it, I think. Is there anything you'd like to ask me? Jason leaned forward in his chair until his elbows touched his knees and struggled for breath. When he had got some semblance of control over his body back, he removed the handkerchief from his mouth and gasped greedily for air. He hadn't laughed so much since the time the nine-headed serpent of the sun had tried to bite him. Not, it should be stated, that Gellos had been in any way outstandingly witty, amusing or novel. It was, as far as Jason could make out, all in the way he told them. Otherwise, why had he nearly had a cerebral hemorrhage when the old gentleman had asked if he wanted a scone? <laughs> no, he croaked. Thank you, I think I've got all that. The thing to remember, Gellos paused politely, while Jason rolled on the floor, kicking his legs helplessly and making little wheezing noises. The thing to remember is that, look, are you feeling quite all right? Would you like a glass of water or something? No! Jason shrieked. I'm fine, really. <laughs> he dabbed him effectually at the tears in his eyes and rose unsteadily to his knees. <laughs> Please go on. I'm sorry, I'm not usually like this. <laughs> he collapsed into a private hell of giggles. Cerberus gave him a look. Three looks. This really only goes to prove, said the old man, equably, what I was saying. There's nothing in the world stronger than laughter. If it can have this sort of effect on someone like you, a hero, son of Jupiter himself, just think what it could do to the ordinary man in the street if only he came into contact with a strong enough dose. I could take over the world and be the one true god with no trouble at all. But I wouldn't want that. He paused while Jason ironed out the spasmodic convulsions in his chest and dragged air into his lungs. Sometimes, the old man was thinking, I don't seem to know my own strength. Look, he said, perhaps it would be better if I changed into the other shape. You know, the threatening statue stuff. Would that help? Jason managed to find just enough strength to nod his head, and immediately the cosy little room vanished, and Jason found himself lying on nothing again, looking at a pair of talons. Better. <laughs> Much, Jason said. Go on with what you were saying. <laughs> I can cut out the hissing snakes if you like. Nah, <laughs> said Jason. That's fine. Just so long as you lay off the jokes, that's all. I don't make jokes, actually, said Gellos wistfully. In fact, sometimes... I wonder what a sense of humour is like. I am disqualified from having one, you see. Jason nodded weakly. The risk of internal combustion, he supposed. Nasty. I wouldn't want to rule the world, exactly, Gellos was saying. Not the world the way it is, you see. It's it's too well completely utterly and irrevocably fucked up for my liking. All I could do would be to take people's minds off it all, and I suppose that's better than nothing. It's what I do now, more or less. But that wouldn't be right, would it? Wouldn't it? No, Gellos said. You see, I'd be making people forget about all the horrible things in the world. And that would mean they'd never do anything about them. And then, of course, something terrible would happen. A plague or a disaster at a power station that sort of thing, and everybody would be so busy laughing about it 
They wouldn't get round to actually doing anything to put it right. And then where would we be? In fact, he added, that's exactly the possibility curve that I've calculated. You know about possibility physics and all that, do you? A bit. Jason said, but let's not get bogged down in all that theory stuff. What you're saying is that you want the world set right before you take over. More or less. And in the meanwhile, you just want to stay where you are and not be bothered by anyone. That's it, yes, said Kellos. People think I came down here where it doesn't actually exist, you know, not as such, to hide from old Jupiter. Not a bit of it. Really? Really. You see, I'm a bit like radiation. I leak. If I was anywhere else in the world but down here, where it isn't actually possible to be, then great excess doses of laughter would sort of seep up through the ground and get into everything, and that would cause absolute chaos. As it is, enough of the stuff gets out to keep the world ticking over, more or less, but it never reaches a critical level, and I think that's how it should stay, for now. I see, said Jason, nodding. So where's the problem? Jupiter, said Galos, and all those other idiots too, of course. They want to kidnap me. Now they don't scare me, not one bit. They would come down here and try throwing their weight about. I could make them laugh so much they'd bust their heavenly guts. The trouble is I'd have to relieve so much laughter it'd be bound to get out into the top side and mess things up for people. That's why it's essential that things are kept under control. Do you see? I think so, Jason said. You need someone to keep the gods off your back for the time being. That's it, said Gelos, nodding. Really, it's a case of making sure they don't get to me. That would have been all right, except they've been looking for me a lot lately. I think the Betamax world, where I don't exist, is reaching critical level. And it was only a matter of time before they did their calculations and found out I was here. That's why I got Prometheus to bring you here. Jason raised his eyebrows. What can I do? he said. Diversion, said Gelos. You can fight the gods for me. Jason stared. Me, he said. You must be kidding. I'm deadly serious, said Gelos. If that's not a contradiction in terms, I want them to think you've rescued me or abducted me and you've somehow got hold of me and you want to take over the universe. Then they attack you and you give them a good hiding and... Excuse me, said Jason, but is that certain? Likely even. Absolute certainty, said Gelos. You see, I shall give you a secret weapon. Oh, good, said Jason. I was hoping you'd say that. Well, Gelos added, the more sort of lend, really. I was thinking of lending you one of the three jokes. Three jokes? Jason's face must have fallen slightly, as if he'd been expecting something a bit more tangible, like a tank. Gelos smiled. Let me explain, he said. As any comedian will tell you, there are only three jokes. All of the jokes are minor variants on the three. They have to be diluted right down before people can take them. Otherwise, well, they'd be fatal. How <laughs> funny, huh? Oh, yes. Now, the first joke, the strongest of them all, is called the Great Primordial. If you were to tell the first joke, you would make the sun laugh so much it would trip and fall onto the earth which would be so cracked up with laughing it would fall into the sea. Jason nodded. Would that be the one about the three Scotsmen and the reel of cotton? he asked. <laughs> no, said Kellos, though I know the one you mean. That's actually one of the lesser arcana of the triple-bodied Zephyr. And if properly told, it can crumple up sheet steel like paper. The great primordial is rather better. Wow, Jason said. The second joke, said Kellos, is called the Celestial Liberum and involves an Englishman, a Pole and a Goth. You've heard of the eruption of Krakatoa? Yes. My fault, confessed Gelos. I have this habit of talking in my sleep sometimes, and one night the punchline, just the punchline you understand, must just have slipped out. By the time it got out past all this nothingness and found its way through the Magmalaya to the South Seas, there wasn't much left of it, I can tell you, but... Jason shuddered. Hot stuff, eh? You could say that, said Gelos. The third joke, he went on, is the weakest of the three. It's known as the Mighty Cloud Spirit joke, and it's more of an anti-personnel joke, really. Knocks out people, leaves buildings standing, that sort of thing. And it's the one I'm going to lend you. Ah, uh, um, I know what you're going to say, said Gelos. Too risky, you were going to say. You're quite right. 
That's why we needed the dog. Jason looked blank. The dog? Quite so, said Gellos. You see, what I propose to do is tell half the joke to you, and then send you out of the room. I shall then put two of the dog's brains to sleep, while I tell one-sixth of the joke to the remaining brain, and so on, until each of the dog's brains knows one-sixth, and you know all the rest. It's a sort of fail-save system, really. Well, uh, I know. Said Gellos. It's still a hell of a lot to ask, but I wouldn't take the risk unless I thought it was absolutely necessary. Trust me. All right, said Jason. Thanks, said Gellos. You remind me a lot of me when I was younger. He added. Jason blinked. I do, he said. Not surprising, really, said Gellos, smiling. We are related, after all. Are we? Oh yes. Gellos said. You see, although I am Gellos, spirit of laughter, I wasn't always what I am now. Before I was Gellos, I was... <laughs> well, never mind that. Here, doggy. Cerberus jumped forward, whacking his tail. Gellos made a slight gesture with his right hand, and the dog was suddenly fast asleep. I put a long joke in his mind, Gellos explained. Good as an anaesthetic I always find. A long joke? Shaggy dog story, I think they're called. Now, are you ready to receive your half of the joke? Jason nodded and braced himself. Although he was very frightened and not a little confused, he knew that the three dots in his mind had become words now, and the sentence was complete at last. Right, said Gellos. There was this guy who went into a bar. 